Hello, and welcome to another episode of Unstuff America. Our guest today is Joseph Paris, who is a internationally renowned thought leader on productivity and excellence. And I'm really excited to have Joseph with us today. He's going to share his thoughts on his own personal productivity, what he does to simplify his life, how he relates to stuff, and of course, uh, the topic of Unstuffing America and what he sees as some ways that we could support people in simplifying their lives so that they can participate more vigorously in their local communities and then the larger community, you know, when we think about the global community as well. Sound like an idea, Joseph? It's great to be here, Andrew. Thanks for inviting me. Of course. Great to have you here. So tell us, tell us the, the listeners, a little bit about yourself, what you do for work, what the home life is like. Do you live alone or with other people? And you know, what, what the configuration of the space is so that we just get a sense of how you live with stuff. Okay. Well, you know, I'm pretty easy to um, remember. I'm Paris from New York living in Frankfurt. <laughs> All right. Um, uh, you know, I, I was born and raised in upstate New York. And um, uh, every, ever since I, I've been younger, uh, very young, uh, I remember just having things organized, you know, whether it was a collection of whatever it might have been, you know, as a, as a child, uh, you know, I had a paper route, um, I had, you know, various jobs. I've, I've, I've been working since I was 13, you know, various jobs. Mm-hmm. I started my company in 1985. And about uh, six years ago, we moved to Frankfurt, Germany from upstate New York. Got it. Um, you know, for me, I got, I got a lot of things going through my airspace all the time. You know, uh, I have several companies, uh, you know, the OPEX Society is one, and uh, we just launched a Readiness Institute, and Zonatec is my legacy consultancy that I've had. Um, but for me to push through, uh, as much uh, a volume of, of activity that I, I do, uh, if I was not organized, uh, things would just fall off the truck. And right. probably the experience of things falling off the truck have reinforced my wanting to be organized. Uh-huh. Uh, so, you know, it's um, if somebody were to ask me where something was, I could tell them exactly where it was. Um, no matter how obscure it is. Right. Well, that's the goal. 30 seconds or less. You should be able to put your hands on anything that is within your sphere. Absolutely. Or even not even in my sphere. If, uh, I keep a lot of my files back in the States Ah. and, uh, you know, and if somebody needs a a document, I could call my father up because it's at his house. Uh I could call my father (laughs) up and I could tell him exactly where that document is, you know, exactly what folder, what bin, um, and sure enough, he could find it in 30 seconds. That's, uh, uh, that's the goal. Yeah. I, it's, 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 it's interesting when you talked about, um, even as a kid, I know that for me, I was not always an organized kid, but the things that mattered to me were the things that were organized. So my, uh, baseball card collection, Yeah, I always knew what I had cause it's impossible to trade baseball cards if you don't know what you have and where they are. And likewise, my matchbox car collection, which was a big, a big thing deal to me as a kid. And those were tidy clothes, books, not things that I really valued as a child. So I would just leave them where I left them. And because I had attentive parents, they, things ended up back on the shelf or in the laundry. So, yeah. Well, even when I was younger, uh, you know, I was in elementary school, uh, I guess it would have been fourth or fifth grade. Uh, you know, I worked in the library and I was all about the Dewey decimal system, ah. you know, and, and organizing the books. <laughs> Uh, you know, I had, uh, I don't know about you, but I had cases for my cars, uh-huh. you know, the, the oh, yeah. suitcases, the briefcases, yeah. uh, instead of just having, carrying them around in a plastic oh, bag. No, no, or paper that, bag. I loved that, that carrying case. It was a trifold. It opened up and th- right. th- they had those little baskets and you could slide the cars in, cars in and out. It was quite awesome. Right. But you know, it wasn't, uh, it's not like, um, you know, maybe I, I am now, but it's not like I'm a neat and orderly freak. You know what I mean? It's not like I'm obsessive compulsive or anything like that. Right. But it really is, it, is I get incredibly frustrated. I have a very short fuse mm. um, when things aren't where they're supposed to be. Got it. Um, uh, you know, I have a tendency to disengage. You know, if, if I have to do a project around the house, I expect a a screwdriver to be where it's supposed to be and the hammer where where it's supposed to be. And if somebody's moved it, you know, that's, that's wasting my time. Right. And, uh, and that's really almost a level of disrespect shown towards me. 
Well, um, and really, I mean, towards everybody. I mean, we can right. we can extrapolate out. So, t- do you live alone? Do you have family? Um, yeah, I have family. I have a, a wife and uh, two boys. Got it. Um, so, so we're all sharing the space together. Yes, we are, and uh, and they don't have my penchant for uh, order. Um, mm-hmm. You know, with, and, and in Germany, it's uh, unusual because you know, in Germany, it's all about the order. Everything's yes, got is. a rule. Everything's got a process. Um, uh, even if they aren't the most efficient things in the world here, uh, at least they are very predictable. Right. Uh, well, great. So uh, what was the last thing excluding food or other consumables that you purchased? Do you, do you remember what that was? Uh, well, I always, you know, purchasing office supplies. I, um, and, and mostly I do it on Amazon uh-huh. now, uh, as opposed to going to stores. A lot of that has to do with, um, the way the retail world works here in Germany. Um, their stores are very sparse. Uh, you know, you go to the bakery for bread and then you go to the, you know, the, the meat shop or the Metzger for uh, the, uh, the meats. And, you, you know, you have to go to all these various places. And, um, you know, I wanted to buy an office chair. I had an office chair that broke. I was on a podcast similar to this. And I leaned uh-huh. back and it just kept on going. And, uh, <laughs> uh, and I know the stores around here, uh, in in Frankfurt, you know, if I go there, they're going to have two or three chairs to to pick from, and uh, you know, you go on Amazon, and and by the way, you have to travel to them, and then you have to go to a couple of stores, and on Amazon, they're all there. So I just right. say, I want that chair. I hit a button, and the next day, it's here. Right. Um, you know, so it, it's about um, it's not it's about not wasting time. Right. You know, uh, and, and I think, you know, a lot of it has to do with, you know, and that's a, a stereotype, but I'm a stereotype, uh, you know, the difference between men and women, you know, I think women shop and men buy. Oh, interesting. I, I think, um, I, I, I'm sure that there are exceptions to that rule. Of course, but, there always are. Right. But um, in, in an interesting way of looking at the difference between uh, when we look at the shades of consumption, right? I mean, yeah. there's an idea of... Uh, shopping being an activity and purchasing something being a task. Right. Right. That's so. exactly right. You know, so, some people like to shop. Um, I'm not one of those people. Yeah. I'm not uh, a big shopper. I do. I, I, I do consume some stuff. Uh, yeah. but I'm, I, I do. I like a certain amount of due diligence and research around what it is that I'm going to buy, but then I'm happy to push a button and be done. I don't, yeah. I don't need a, the activity of the research is a necessary process to to discover what you know at the price point and the functionality what the item delivers and is it what i want and then when i'm done i'm ready to just pull pull the trigger yeah absolutely I, you know you do your research you know like i you know i had there's hundreds of chairs you know i'm just right. picking on this because it's a recent you know purchase and sure. it's fresh but uh you know there's there's a hundred chairs and uh you know i was able to narrow it down and um when I found the one that I thought, you know, fortunately with Amazon, you have all these different pictures, you know, what right. I mean? uh, you know, if, I, I didn't look at any that didn't have multiple views. Um, uh, I just passed them by cause you know, you just can't tell what you're buying. Right. Um, but you know, and then of course there's the reviews, which I think are very helpful. You know, you Sometimes, get a couple yeah, that you, yeah. you, you know, that you're interested in and, uh, you, you hear what other people had to say about it. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and you know, it really helps out. Great. That's excellent. That's, uh, so that's a recent purchase. What about the last thing you let go of is, uh, can you remember the last thing that you've released back out into the world? Well, I mean, you know, yeah, the broken chair <laughs> <laughs> that was, that was released back out into the world. Um, excellent. Yeah. Uh, and what, what is, so what is recycling like in Germany? Where, where does that chair go? Does it end up in landfill? Does it get processed and broken apart into its, uh, into its recyclable components? You know, um, Germany is um, very, in fact, the, the chair is still here um, because it's, it's very difficult to get rid of large goods. Mm. Okay. Uh, they have, a, a, I'll get into it in a moment, but in Germany, they're very big into recycling. Uh, and it's very complex. Like we have four different garbage cans here at the house. Okay. Plus we have to go and just, uh, um, return our, our, uh, plastic bottles and our, and our cans and our, our regular uh, drinking uh, bottles at a store to get a, a refund back. 
um, and we have to drive someplace else to offload any glass that's not uh, doesn't have a refund on it, you know, like a wine bottle or something right. like that. Uh, but other than that, they have uh, um, organics, a, a can for organics, right? Um, a can for recycled paper. Uh, they use a, um, a thing called a Gelbazak, uh, which is a, which is quite literally a yellow bag, a yellow uh-huh. plastic bag for recyclables. Um, and then they have another little bin for what we'll call uh, garbage, just, you know, the non-organic garbage. Right. But unfortunately, I can't fit my chair into, <laughs> into this thing. So uh, in order to get rid of these larger goods, you just don't leave them outside. Uh, you actually have to take them to a uh, depot uh, for larger goods, um, uh, which is run by the town. And, and it's just a hassle. Um, that part's just a hassle. Right. You know, we're in the States. You could just put it out to your curb and, and poop. You know, it's gone. Right. Although the, I will, we can do that here in the U.S., but I think it does beg the question of where does it go? I mean, it leaves your home, but is it, is the trash picking it up? Is it ending up in landfill or is it going someplace where it's going to be processed? I know that certainly here in New York, we have those large recycle days where uh, at Union Square or other key locuses where trucks will arrive and you can bring those big oversized items there to be processed so that they don't just end up in the garbage because it's we we're running certainly here in new york we're running out of places to put stuff right and then it just ends up barge floating around the island of manhattan which nobody wants right 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 so all right well so when we think about uh on a scale from one to ten just i mean it sounds like you're you're pretty high up on the scale one being the least organized ten being the most organized where would you put yourself just so that we have i'd give myself a good solid eight five excellent very good very good. And um, at work, so y- y- your work is virtual or you're on site. Is that correct? I I mean, want, yeah. You know, I, I work out of my home. Right. Um, and our clients are all publicly traded multinationals. They got, you know, their facilities everywhere. Uh, so when we actually engage, uh, that engagement might be remotely, it might be on site, you know, come, come, you know, whatever, whatever is most useful or most efficient. Right. Uh, you know, uh, sometimes efficiency isn't built into it um, for, you know, happenstance, you know, prioritizations, we've got to drop everything, go to a meeting. And of course, you know, airfare from, you know, Germany or from anywhere for that matter can be, you know, a factor, not to mention the time that's involved. Right. But uh, even getting to um, organizing flights and, and travel logistics, which, uh, I would consider myself expert level um, uh-huh. at this point. Uh, you know, one of the reasons we moved to Frankfurt was, uh, you know, I could get direct almost everywhere from here, um, at least uh, every major city. Right. Uh, maybe sometimes there's going to be a, 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 you know, one one switch of a plane, but uh, almost always it's direct. Uh, and uh, when I travel, I make sure that um, I never have less than three hours of layover. Less um, than three hours. So you've than, always, you've always got a cushion in there. And what uh, do you do with that layover time? Well, if everything, you know, you know, going back to the States, which is, you know, if, if I was flying domestic, like basically from, well, from Frankfurt, everywhere in Europe is, is direct. So it doesn't, that doesn't really count. Right. But, you know, back in the States, if I were to fly, um, you know, from Binghamton where I lived, uh, you know, to Nashville, I'm going to have to clear through, you know, Chicago or someplace. Right. Uh, there wasn't a direct flight. Um, so what I would want to make sure of is that uh, I have a cushion because there's nothing worse than having to rush through an airport and just barely miss, uh, make the, or miss the flight, you know, just a stress level. Right. Um, if everything goes, you know, perfectly according to plan, depending on the time of day, uh, even though I believe that airports don't have time, uh, it just, you know, uh, daytime or nighttime, uh, you know, I'll sit down and have coffee or a beer or whatever it might be. Uh-huh. Uh, just, you know, just to, to relax for a little bit. So, so that travel time is really, it's not necessarily hyper productive in the sense of, I mean, it's, it's peace of mind stuff, but it's not, you're not running into a lounge, plugging in and trying to crank out 45 minutes worth of work. If you've got some time, you're no, I don't do that. As, as a matter of fact, I'm the anti that when I get on an airplane, I never take my computer out. I never work uh, when I'm in transit. Um, 
not ever. The only, the only thing I do when I'm in transit is I catch up on my, my reading, my, my economist magazines. I, you know, in fact, I just, I'm going to the States tomorrow <laughs> and I just packed five issues of it because I don't get rid of, uh, uh an issue until I've read, read it. So, right. uh, they get stacked up a little bit and, um, you know, it's, it's just, I find that travel is the only time when I'm actually not able to get poked. Uh-huh. You know, no, so, I, I, I'm with you on that. I, it's, I deliberately don't buy Wi-Fi access. I figure it's, this is, I'm, I'm a hostage on the plane for the duration that I'm there. And it's actually, it's, I'm happy to surrender to the disconnectedness of the experience. Yeah, that's exactly I'd, it. I'd rather read, nap, eat, watch a movie, do anything other than task. It just, it feels like I spend enough of my time tasking that the travel could actually be, in that sense, a sense of mindfulness and, a, and presence of, I'm just doing one thing, which is I'm traveling from one location to another. Right. I don't feel like I need to be super productive in that window of time. Right, right. And for me, it's, it's one of the few moments that, um, I'm not able to be reached by the outside. Right. Yeah. You know, awesome. so yeah. yeah. I, 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 I dread the day when I can actually have to listen to my neighbors talking on their cell phones, having conversations, you know, at 36,000 feet. I hope. Yeah. That, that uh, I hope that day never comes. I really yeah. do. Right. So uh, take us through just a, like a typical day. Um, do you, in the morning, do you plan in the morning? Do you plan the night before? How do you, when you are looking at your schedule and, and trying to move through time and space, where's the, where's the planning take place? And, and uh, just so that we can get a sense of that. Well, I, I do, um, uh, I, I do a, a briefing in the morning, you know, even though if it's all by myself, I do a briefing right. in the morning. Uh, I, I mean, my whole routine is I wake up uh, and I catch up on um, my feeds, you know, yeah. you know how you read the newspaper in the morning. Well, yeah. you know, instead of a newspaper, now we have our feeds and I catch up on the news because I'm six hours ahead of, of the States, you know, right. East coast. And so a lot of things usually happen um, overnight. Yeah. So I catch up on that and I catch up on um, uh, the incoming emails just to see what might be disturbing my day. Right. And then I match that against my, what I call my briefing, mm -hmm. which is uh, you know, what I've, what, the previous night um, I laid out to do today. So I'm just getting reoriented. Yep. Uh, after I get reoriented um, in that, uh, in that moment, I actually go for a drive in the car for about 15 minutes, 10 or 15 minutes. It, you know, it's maybe it's a habit from the States uh, when I used to have an office and I used to drive to it, but mm -hmm. it sort of gets me in a, uh, you know, when I come back, I'm here for work. I've commuted to work, if you will. Interesting. And, uh, and then during the day, um, you know, I'm cranking through all the things that I have to, you know, I have planned. And of course, taking care of the injects, which are the unplanned things that, that you know, interfere. Uh, I'll, I'll uh, do a sit rep, a situation report uh, midday, just to assess where I'm at. And then at the end of the day, I put everything where it's supposed to be. You know, Excellent. I go through all the files and all, all the papers that might be on my desk and I say, okay, these have been done. These are pending. Um, you know, and, uh, and the next day I come in and I start the whole thing over again. Great. So as far as interruptions go, cause they are a huge time killer. How do you handle those, those, what do you call those injections? Those injects injects. Well, how do you, ha how do you handle that stuff when it's showing up? Um, well, uh, I, I'm, I'm very, I'm, I'm fierce about defending my borders. Okay. Um, I will never answer the phone if it rings, period. I'll just never answer the phone if it rings uh, unless it was a scheduled call. Got it. Um, you know, otherwise, uh, you know, nobody sends a voice, reads or listens to voicemail anyway. So almost everything is by email. If we want to have an actual conversation, we'll schedule it up. Even if it's five minutes from now, it's sure. going to be something that's, that's going to be um, uh, decided because uh, I read once, I don't know how true it is, but I'm, I think it's pretty true based on my experience. If you're in the ta in the middle of a task, it takes you 15 minutes or so, 10 to 15 minutes to set up for that task. And when you're working that task, if you're interrupted, then it's going to take you another 10 or 15 minutes to re-engage that task. Yeah, the statistic actually that I've read is uh, it's up to 23 minutes for a recovery from an interruption. So, I mean, yeah. it's huge. Two interruptions, two recoveries, that's an hour lost. And 
Yeah, yeah I'm, I'm with you there. I mean, so, so I, I viciously uh, defend my borders. So um, no pinging, nothing uh, while you're tasking uh, and focused on something. There's no chat windows b- popping oh, up. No, I, no- have, I, have, I have Skype going on and I have, you know, WhatsApp going on and, and whatever else. Uh, and, you know, the email is active. So, you know, things, things are coming and flowing in uh, as, they, uh, as they're apt to flow in. But I don't react to it um, until or unless uh, uh, you know I need to switch gears. Got it. You so, know, so are you are you seeing the notification or you don't even you don't even have the notifications? Yeah, sometimes I see them, sometimes I don't. I mean, you know, the com- the computer in the lower right hand corner is always you know popping up some bubble or something or another. But um, I usually don't let it distract me. Got it. Um, unless, of course, I'm expecting something from somebody and and I see that person flash up, then I then I uh, then I know that. Uh, you know, there might be some further action right. going on. All right. So that's, I mean, I think for the listeners to just, uh, to, for uh, I, what I'm hearing, I mean, you're a highly accomplished time manager. You manage yourself well in relationship with time. For the listeners who maybe don't consider themselves to be a black belt in it or a ninja, it's helpful to note that maybe having things popping up are not going to serve you, listener, uh, that if if you're easily distracted by things that flash up in front of you, that it might be a good idea to turn those notifications off and cycle through every hour, every 90 minutes, every two hours to see what's happened while you're focused on some other big piece of work so that you're not, the, the notifications don't, don't pull your focus. Yeah, oh, I agree. Oh. I agree with that. You know, um, it takes a bit of a discipline to ignore those bubbles. Yeah. Um, and uh, you know, what I'll uh, oftentimes, you know, you're in a task and sometimes you just need to get out. You know what yep. I mean? Sometimes you just say, I'm too close to this. I have to clear my head. And then I kick back and then I look at the, you know, the various notifications or see what might have come in the last, you know, 10 minutes or, or whatever it is. Um, uh, but I don't, uh, I don't let, I don't let them pull me. Right. I think that that's the difference is that you, um, <clears throat> you have, Discipline is a funny word, and so I'm I'm mindful of not wanting to throw that around because I, sometimes I feel like there's this idea of exerting some external pressure is is <clears throat> people's concept of discipline that it's about willpower or something else as opposed to focus. And you have uh, tremendous focus. I think for folks who are building that muscle, supporting themselves in that gym activity, you know, to, to stretch the metaphor is the fewer things that are going to pull your focus, the better. And that, that you also leverage that in a strategic way to, I need a break. Now I'm going to, I'm going to go look over here. I need a break. I'm going to go look over there that you're driving that, that you're not, you're not reactive. You're actually still in control of how the, the activity is flowing forward. And I think that that's the, that's a key takeaway is, you want to be driving and you want to do everything you can to, as the driver, to uh, make sure that adequate blinders are on you so you stay focused on the center line and stay in your lane and you keep moving forward. Yeah. It, one of the challenges uh, is for people that are very empathetic, mm. you know, because they always want to serve, they always want to serve. And I, you know, I, you know, depending on who you talk to, I think I'm, uh, you know, very empathetic because, you know, my business is all, all about serving others. Right. Um, and so their tendency is oftentimes to respond to any immediate need that comes in. You know, I want to help this person. I want to help this person. But what they have to realize is that they can actually service more people more efficiently if they just queue them up, you know, prioritize them and queue them up um, and dictate the pace of that service rather than being scattered. Um, and, and I think that if they were able to realize that and rationalize that, that they're actually able to help more people by having a little bit more structure, um, as opposed to discipline, maybe structure is a better way of saying it. Yeah, I think, um, uh, you know, they, they're actually able to, um, help more people more efficiently. Yeah. Which is a great takeaway because I, I know that, for those of us who are in service positions, service industries, you know, our work is about service. It is, we deal with a lot of people that have, uh, that are needy. I mean, across the spectrum. And it's when you see somebody in pain or you see somebody suffering, that's the idea is, oh, let me go extinguish that in this moment. 
and you end up on what I call the volunteer fire department. You're running around putting out all these fires for folks. Yeah. You get to the end of the day, you're exhausted, you're covered in, you know, virtual soot. And you think, God, I, all of the things that I had planned for today, none of them got done. So nobody's on my fire department. Nobody's coming to put out my fires. And now, I, now that everybody else's fires are out, I, I put out my own. It just, you're exhausted. It depletes you. It's a very, um, it, it drains your energy. So it's, it's, right. it's a great takeaway to remember that even though it might feel counterintuitive, it's a, you, will, you will have greater impact it, broader right. and deeper by focusing in and, as you said, queuing people up and moving through them methodically rather than just running around trying to rescue people willy-nilly based on their saying, hey, help, help, over here. And, and the thing, you get, what, what you really have to be careful of is that sometimes they're saying help, they don't really need it. They just want you to do the work for them. Aha. Uh -huh. <laughs> okay. So I, this is, you know, this is uh, some serious stuff. I mean, especially if you're in a management or leadership position is that uh, you have to enable, um, you know, the people to do the work that needs to be done. And you, you have to trust them to be able to do that. And part of that trust is, is when they come to you for help, you got to sometimes just tell them to figure it out themselves. Right. Um, or, or, uh, or, you know, Google it, you know, uh -huh. uh, for lack of a better term. I had this uh, one project years and years ago. This is in the late 90s. And, uh, it was, you know, we had to cut some code for a client. And, uh, and the lead programmer on it was ha struggling with a piece of code. Uh, and, and the client was getting a little anxious. And uh, I said, listen, you know, um, why don't you just go out to one of those forums and pose your problem? And, uh, you know, it was in Microsoft Access. And, and maybe somebody will, you know, be able to help you out. And his response to me was like, well, geez, Joe, you know, if I have another day or two, I could figure it out myself. I said, listen, we're not inventing anything here today. You know, somebody out there has already, you know, had this problem and solved this problem. Right. So why don't, while you're figuring it out, why don't you just post it? And I'll never forget, he, within 90 minutes, it was solved. Mm -hmm. And the guy who solved it, I'll never forget his email address. I'm sure it's not valid, you know, you know 30 years or 25 years later. But right. uh, his email address was Rodriguez at Rocket Ranch dot nasa dot gov <laughs> okay and i said see robert it took a rocket scientist to figure out your problem right but the point is the client our clients or the people that come to us um uh, for help uh, they don't necessarily care if we help them you know they just want the help right so part of our job is putting the people that have a need in in touch with the people that can satisfy that need and it doesn't necessarily have to be us that is an excellent takeaway as well. And, and so that's the, that's the professional application, but I think also on the personal application, it's there as well, right? I mean, you've got a community, you've got neighbors, you've got a community around you. There's somebody has probably dealt with your challenge already and dealt with it successfully and has a, has a solution for you to broaden your, when you're looking for the answer to be able to broaden your uh, your field of search right. so that you are receptive to, I don't have to have the best answer and it might not be anybody in my immediate circle that has the answer, but I'm going to put it out there and see what comes back to me. Cause again, it, unless I'm literally trying to cure cancer and nobody has been able to do that yet, chances are this problem, somebody's faced it already and has a solution. And if I just ask for it and ask enough times, I'm going to get, I'm going to get a response back and be able to move on. And, and I don't need to spend so much time trying to generate the answer myself. Right, right, right. No, I, we've all moved, right? You know, yeah. you move across state or across country and that's, uh, uh, that's nothing compared to, you know, moving from the United States to a foreign country. Right. Uh, you know, language issues, cultural issues, um, every, every little thing is different. Um, mm -hmm. and it takes a, uh, you know, a person that's willing to ask for that help, you know, figure out who's done it before. You know, fortunately we have social media nowadays and, yeah. uh, and even though they might like, there's, um, uh, American speakers here in Germany, there's a group called American speakers in Germany. And, if I have a uh, an issue, we could just or somebody has an issue, they could just post it in that forum, 
and they might not get complete answers, but they get uh, enough information to give them some guidance. Mm -hmm. Uh, And, you know, that's infinitely, uh, infinitely valuable. Yeah, excellent. So tell me, if there was one thing about the world that you could change today, what would that be? Oh, man. Uh, the one, you know what? The one thing I would, is um, I would like to get rid of, uh, to borrow somebody else's phrase, fake news. Uh huh. Okay. And I'm not talking about, you know, left or right, because there's fake news abounds. You know what I yes. mean? It's just like, it's everywhere. And if you're trying to get the answers, there's a lot of noise that you sometimes have to sift through. Mm-hmm. And, you know, people will cite, what I'll say non-credible sources as um, the source for their, their wisdom. Yes. And, uh, and it's, it's incredibly misplaced and it just really does slow down everything. Yep. Uh, so if there was one thing I, that, that I could wave a magic wand and get rid of it, uh, it's the fake news. Uh, you know, I was watching this um, uh, uh, interview or a uh, town hall meeting, Lindsey Graham, uh, who's on CNN here in Germany. So I'm listening to Lindsey Graham and, you know, he's got some, you know, interesting ideas and I wanted to listen to him and he would speak for 30 seconds and then the pundits would come on and start telling me what he's saying, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? And offering their insights. And it's like, you know what? I really don't care what your insights are. I want to listen to the man. Right. Let me just hear it. I, you know, I'm, I'm a critical thinker. I can think for myself. Let me just listen to them and I could pass my own judgment. But right. it seems like everything that we read is now packaged, packaged and delivered to us. Mm-hmm. And it just makes me um, suspicious of the whole thing. And like yeah. I said, this is not a, a left or a right. No, side no, I hear you. It's, it's all over the it place. Happens on, <clears throat> it happens on both ends of the spectrum and all the way from left to right. At any at any point along the spectrum, you can find fake news. You can find fabricated um, opinion being passed along as a fact. And yeah, yep. yeah, that's so. You know, I get my news sources. I think the Economist is a great uh, uh, magazine and a great website, and they they usually you know um, uh, give you news in the Walter Cronkite kind of manner. Yes, uh, you know, Reuters is a good source. AP is a good source. Um, it, but you get too much further beyond that and uh and you start getting spin and right. uh, and i think that's a uh, there's some peril in that i i agree with you completely uh, I'll, I'll, let's uh, let's pivot to unstuff america and when you heard that first expression when i invited you to be on the show and when you think about unstuffing america what what does that conjure up for you what what does that mean to you well, it means getting rid of, uh, you know, the, uh, the clutter, you know, the, the stuff you think about George Carlin and you, we get, mm-hmm. we, we rent places to store our stuff. And, and, uh, uh, and I think that, uh, you know, we accumulate a lot of, we'll call it uh, stuff we don't need, yep. you know, just you know, stuff that takes up space. Um, you know, use it once and, and discard it. And, you know, I, you know, everybody's guilty of it to, to various degrees. My, my biggest guilt is that when I, I do a lot of traveling, mm-hmm. so I'll have a tendency to buy some, some, something unique from that area. Like mm-hmm. if you look, look behind me, you see a zebra, you know, it's I do a, see the zebra. You know, a zebra, it's sort of like a, you know, a little, one of those little accordion walls, you uh-huh. know, and, and uh, I, I've been to Africa several times. So if you went and looked at, at my office, you'd see some African artifacts and you'd see a couple of steins here and, and there's a bottle of vodka from Russia. And, you know, just like, you know, um, uh, you know, some, some spoils of war, if you will. I guess it goes mm-hmm. back to, the, you, know, the, you know, the Roman times when, when the, you know, the, the conquering uh, 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 general would, would march into triumph and all of the things from the wonderful world would be behind him. Of course, I don't bring back lions and tigers and bears and stuff right. like that, you know, but, but I do bring back uh, mementos. Uh-huh. Um, and most of the mementos will have some sort of story behind it or will yep. invoke a story. Um, and to me, uh, inst- you know, instead of buying um, you know, a fancy car, you know, I, I drive a Volkswagen Passat, you know, so it's nothing, nothing fancy here. Um, I would rather spend my money uh, on uh, travel and building memories. Uh-huh. You know, like when I, when I travel on an engagement, like I went, I, I had an engagement in Russia 
Uh, and, you know, even though it was only a two day engagement, I ended up spending five days there. You know, the client was paying for it, uh, happy to do it. Most people I find will, uh, are, are, uh, um, will love to show off where they live. Uh huh. Um, and especially if you're, you're really genuinely interested in what's going on there and not just want to go to the tourist traps. Right. Um, and so I, I spent the extra time cause I, I have a lot of consultants that work with me. Mm-hmm. They go someplace and they say, geez, Joe, that was a really cool place. I have to go back there and visit sometime. And I'm like, dude, you're there. Right. Somebody paid for your airfare. You know, worst case scenario, you're out of pocket for a hotel night or two and some, some meals. Right. But, you know, you'll never get back there on your right. own. You'll never have that opportunity. And, uh, you know, I remember the um, financial crisis. I never knew how many uh, poor rich people I knew. Uh, you know, they were leveraged just like the average schmo. Their, their leverage just had more zeros in it. Their income had more zeros and their, and their obligations had more zeros. And, right. I, and um, you know, when, when, uh, if I have grandchildren, when they sit on my lap, they're not going to hear about the cool car I bought, my Ferrari or something like that, or, or the killer deal I did in the stock market. Right. They're going to tell me, oh, geez, Joe, when you went to grandpa, when you went to, uh, to Mozambique, can you tell us about the, the, you know, what happened at the border? Or can you tell me about going to Graceland and, and, and Malangani? And, uh, uh, you know, these are cool stories. Right. And you can't, you can't, um, you know, that car will leave. Yes. The deal, will. you know, will leave. But, uh, you know, God forbid, you know, it happens on occasion. But, you know, those memories stay with us for, uh, for forever. Right. Well, and, they're, and they are the currency that we get to share, actually, with the people around us, whether they're children, grandchildren, or friends, neighbors. It doesn't really matter. Right. It's, it is, it's, the, it's the qualitative augmentation of the fabric of our lives are these experiences and certainly from uh, from where i sit we often misplace our attention on these objects as if the objects themselves are going to be responsible for the memory as opposed to us being able to experience something really deeply and then share that with others right i mean I, i've done a fair amount of traveling and it's a it's it's often sweeter with somebody else whether it's somebody who's your host or it's a companion that you're bringing with you either way the ability to turn to somebody else and say oh my god this is a, who knew this was amazing what a great view what a great meal what a great thing what a great dance performance it doesn't again it you know what a great display at the bazaar. Yeah. The, the activity itself is sometimes less significant than being able to participate in something that is not a task, right, not right, holding right. the laundry. Right, right. You know, I, I find that, uh, and I, I'm usually fairly fortunate in this regard. Uh, when I, um, I travel, uh, the people that I'm uh, meeting uh, make great hosts um, uh, almost always. Uh, they they want to share with you, um, you know, the, the way they live, the the way they eat, what they eat, where they eat. You know, I remember I went to Monterrey, Mexico, first time in Mexico uh, on an engagement uh, with the university, and uh, you know the students took me out one night and they said, you know, what, what do you want to eat? And I said, listen, what I want to eat is I want to get a, a taco from a street vendor. You know, a sloppy, greasy taco from a street vendor. That's what I want. Um, and they couldn't believe that that's what I wanted. But, you know, uh, you know that's uh, in a beer, yeah. <laughs> you know, and, uh, and that's what I had. And yeah, had I want to eat where you eat. I don't want yeah. I don't. I don't need a fancy meal. I mean, uh, fancy meals are lovely, but I want to experience the world through your through your eyes, through your, you know, what, what's a day like for you here? Because right, right. that's the thing that I'll never get to experience on my own. I, no book is going gonna, is gonna to show me in the same way that somebody who comes to New York, they could, you know, they could take the circle line, they could do whatever they're going to do to see the surface of Manhattan, but I can take them places where they'll, they would never find them in a book. Right, right, right. 
and that would be a that would be a unique experience. Well, we're just about at time, so I'm just wondering, do you have any last thoughts, anything else about simplifying your life, uh, being present, uh, making strategic choices that you want to share with the listeners, that, that uh, send them out into the world with some uh, some fire and some uh, good thoughts? Yeah, I, I I would say the only thing I would say is that um, if you can't simplify your life just don't let others complicate it excellent (laughs) very good i think that's a great way to end super if you can't simplify your life don't let other people complicate it for you so at least you'll say it'll be a net zero experience (laughs) that's right awesome well joe it's been great talking with you today thanks for taking the time to uh to share your your thoughts your wisdom with the listeners and and me i'm it's been great to spend this time with you Well, thank you very much for having me, Andrew. Of course. Thanks.